ladies and gentlemen, Joel and Ethan Cohen. Welcome, guys, and congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you. It is, as I mentioned, a, uh, a 1950s set comedy about a studio production chief, a studio fixer, and the various crises that he goes through, including one uh, with an actor on a Ben-Hur-like epic. What was it about this era and setting that appealed to you guys? Um, well, the idea, I think, originated with uh, our thinking about the character that Josh Brolin plays in the movie, who is very, very loosely um, based on a real person who was a uh, vice president of MGM in the 40s and 50s and was essentially a studio fixer. So we thought it would be interesting to make a movie that was 24 hours in the life of this character, Eddie Mannix. I don't know why then specifically, 50 or 51, whenever, which is roughly when the movie takes place. Well, actually, I do know why. Uh, because the story involves, the plot involves a particularly overblown uh, sandal movie, a biblical epic that the studio is making, and that's kind of the heyday of that kind of uh, decadent Hollywood movie. It also seems like the perfect nexus in time of when Hollywood was trying to keep all of its sort of dirty secrets or semi-dirty secrets under wraps, but kind of couldn't at the same time because there was lots of competition, whether from, from television or there was more gossip magazines or things like that. But it was sort of, it was all, it wasn't like the 30s and 40s. It was a different time, wasn't it? Well, that's probably true. It was probably the end of the, you're right, the end of the era when they could sort of keep the lid on things. Um, but in the early 50s, where the, when this movie took place, they were still managing to do that. And, and uh, right, that's part of what the movie's about. Did you guys do a lot of research into, the, into that era? Or did you just know it? Were you just kind of aware of certain stories, you know, apocryphal or not, that would, that would fit in? No, no research. Yeah, we just kind of uh, cherry-picked. Not even cherry-picked. We made use of what we know just from... Uh, I don't know, being interested in the movie business, no research per se. The real person, Eddie Mannix, whose name Josh Brolin shares is actually in fact nothing like our character, except that his, as Joel said, his job was sort of uh, that job description. Uh, but no, we generally don't do research, it's just whatever happens to be rattling around in our heads. Although there was a, a certain amount of, I don't know if you'd call it research, but sort of R&D in terms of um, some of the production numbers that we did in the movie, um, which uh, were meant to not even recall, but sort of stand in for or, or be almost feel like lost examples of those kinds of numbers that were done in movies at that time. So there's a number in, we shot in the big Esther Williams pool that still exists at Sony, uh, where they shot all the Esther Williams movies and those sort of big water extravaganzas, most of them choreographed by Busby Berkeley, were done. Um, and there's a, there's a tap dancing number, musical number, um, in the movie that's a little bit reminiscent of something that Gene Kelly might have done in the movie, that Channing Tatum does. Um, yeah, also, so that kind of thing. We, we looked at a lot of that stuff. Right, and for more like narrow technical reasons, we looked at a lot of the stuff, like the Ben-Hur battle scene, that, that stuff that we shot in tanks, um, exterior stuff that we shot in tanks, process, a lot of process stuff, but not, uh, again, more for figuring out what we could do and how things would look. Yeah, a lot of this was a strange exercise in sort of reverse engineering things from a technical point of view that, um, you know, aren't done anymore. And we were using new technology to essentially recreate, or partially they were done with new technology, to recreate things and effects that were done a long time ago in a different way. Like, well, they're all, I mean, there are a lot of examples, but the Esther Williams stuff, we looked at that and we figured, I, you just, you don't know how they did that and you don't, quite know why anyone would want to now. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You guys have done so many things. 
over the course of your career, you were able to do some new things on, on this film, like those production numbers. Was that a thrill, give you guys a kick, to, to be able to do something like that? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, one of the fun things about making the movie was that uh, every week it, we were shooting a different movie. So um, it would, you know, we would, <laughs> we would go from doing this sort of Ben-Hur kind of biblical epic out in... Simi Valley to shooting on sound stages and doing these tap dance numbers to going into shooting in these water ballets to going in you know it was that part of it was a lot of fun it's kind of fantastic it won't mean anything to the audience now but the, there's a scene with uh, Alden Aaron Reich and Ray Fines for which we built I'm sure the biggest pink set in Hollywood history <laughs> We'll take a look at that scene actually in a little bit. That's a very funny scene. This is the scene with Channing Tatum, I believe, right? With the dance sequence. Okay, well, he's about to start dancing. <laughs> From a writing point of view, guys, um, obviously all of your films have got some humor in them, but something that, that like this, sort of along the lines of Intolerable Cruelty or Big Lebowski, is there a different process that you have to writing comedies, outright comedies like this, rather than things like No Country for Old Men or Inside Lewin Davis? Not really. I, I, uh, no. You just sit down and try and make the story go. And sometimes they're they're comedies, and sometimes they're not. I, uh, but no, the process is really the same. I'd be hard pressed to tell you what the process was on either of them, frankly. But I, I, uh, it's just problem solving, really. And this story you guys had worked on for a while, I guess this probably actually happens to you guys a lot, where you have the germ of an idea, maybe you put it aside, you go for something else. But this one, from what I've read, kind of about 10 years ago or so, you had the idea of an actor in a biblical epic. You had mentioned it to George Clooney and said, we want you to do this, would you? Yeah, we, uh, just that premise, basically, a big actor in Hollywood in roughly this era gets kidnapped um, off the set of a movie which we uh, shared with Clooney shortly after we met him. And for some reason, he kept announcing Hail Caesar as his next picture once every couple of years. Um, uh, although we hadn't written anything beyond the premise. So uh, after we finished our last movie, we decided to sit down and write it. We were sort of at loose ends, and we thought, I don't know, George keeps announcing it. We might as well do it. After 10 years of prompting from George, right? Time to actually do it. Actually, we have a scene with Clooney right now. Let's take a look at George Clooney in Hail Caesar. This is your fourth film with Clooney, right? Uh, he, did, he is so funny in all of them. Um, what's your relationship with him like? I would imagine that when you guys call, he probably like, breathes out a sigh of relief, like, finally, I get to be silly again. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, we, we always ask George to play an idiot. <laughs> And after we did Burn After Reading on the last day of the show, he said, all right, boys, I've played my last idiot. <laughs> and then we sent him this script, and he decided to come back for one more. So, um, uh, <laughs> no, he's, you know, he's very game, and we always have a lot of fun with George. <laughs> You're laughing, Ethan. Was there something you wanted to say? Was there an anecdote? Because I, I feel like I feel like George Clooney is such a smart actor, and we all know such a smart man. We all know that. I actually think that to play really dumb, you actually have to be really yes, smart. Yes, you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. And yeah, and right. You have to not have uh, a certain kind of vanity, which <laughs> George, which George is, is, you know, blissfully free of any kind of. Actually, you know, he plays a movie star in this, but he's very free of any kind of movie star vanity. And um, he's happy to whimper and snivel, as you saw. <laughs> Let's take another, another look at a clip from Hail Caesar, this time one with Scarlett Johansson. Her little mental calculation there is just, hey, yeah, pretty sure. Uh, that's Josh Brolin, of course, there as well, who's fantastic. Um, with your actors, uh, Josh and Scarlett have worked with you guys as well before. Are there actors that maybe you'll meet them in your, or you know of them, and you'll say, you know what, these, they would be great for not this project, but the next one? you kind of have people in mind for subsequent projects as things go yeah, on? Yeah, so, sometimes we tend to write a lot for specific actors, it's true, or... Um, the other way it works frequently is that we'll work with someone on a specific movie in a specific part and have a lot of fun with them and, uh, and then just start thinking about what else 
might be fun to see them play. So that can be the sort of beginning of a new project or we're working on another project and, and, and we end up writing for that actor again. So we do tend to work over and over again with the same people. What about on the, on the project itself? Have you ever had a moment where you've been filming or maybe during rehearsal and you say, wow, this person is really great. Let's write another few scenes with that character or are they pretty much locked in by the time you're, you're at that point? <clears throat> that doesn't happen just because the process is so involved that you gotta kinda know what you're doing in terms of production before you start. We don't, uh, you know, some people make movies that way, but we don't. I also just want a uh, question about the, the writing process. There, of course, the famous story of when you guys were writing Miller's Crossing uh, and you had writer's block, so you decided you couldn't, you couldn't work your way through it, so you turned your attention to Barton Fink, uh, a movie about a writer with a block, and, and worked it out that way. Does that sometimes happen with, with other scripts that are not as intricate, I guess, as Miller's Crossing, but still need some, some finessing? Do you maybe put it aside for a little bit and turn to another one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, as w this one was really just a premise for several years, but that's not uh, unusual that in various stages we'll set them aside and turn to something else, um, just because we can. If we're like not making headway on a script, we'll set it aside and, and start something else. Happened with we put Fargo to you know we wrote the first maybe two thirds and put it away for a couple of years. Came back to it. Uh, Oh, brother, where art thou? We kind of came and went with. Yes, that does happen. And keeping along the lines of collaborators, so many of your collaborators for so long have been on our radars. Carter Burwell, who's amazing, uh, who does the music for all your films and, and is terrific, and, and Roger Deakins you're working with again. When you find a collaborator like that, you obviously click with them if the schedules all work, but is there like a shorthand that you guys have with them now that they know what you're going for, or do you kind of go see them at some point and say, we're thinking of something like this for that? or? Yeah, well, it's similar to what you were asking about with actors. It's, you know, it's a different kind of collaboration, but it's a, uh, it's a similar thing where you have a very congenial working relationship with someone, whether they're an actor, whether they're shooting the movie or writing the music for the movie. And uh, we, tend to, um, we tend to work with the same people over and over again behind the camera as well. Yeah, there's a shorthand. I mean, there's a... Well, like uh, Roger, it's beyond shorthand. We've done 10 or 12 movies with him and... Talk we don't less talk to him less. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just let him go. Yeah. There's a new actor. I mean, you guys haven't worked with Ray Fiennes before, right? Is this this is your first uh, collaboration with Ray Fiennes? Yes. Uh, this is the first time. I'm. You know, we've been real. Well, he's a good example of somebody yeah. whose work we'd clocked for a long time, and uh, uh, just what you were asking before, and and thought. He would be fun to work with, and then you come up with an idea that's kind of the right fit, and 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 you know there you go. Yeah. So it's I have to say Ray's a really good Ray's a really good example of having someone in the back of your head thinking about wanting to work with them, and then realizing that as we were writing this that there was an opportunity here to do something he'd be great at. To show how well Ray Fine fits into the Coen Brothers world, we're going to take a look at a clip of Rafe right now in Hail Caesar. Would that it were so simple. Uh, I want to ask about lines like that and how beautiful so many of those phrases are in so many of your films. The wordplay, I mean, whether it's things like, hell, I can get you a toe by three o'clock with nail polish, or, you know, uh, the dude abides. You guys have such a, a terrific gift for finding those lines that resonate in our heads for days, weeks, years afterwards that you can hear them. How often do you, I mean, do you work on crafting those when you say, if you write it first, say, no, that's not quite right, let's try a twist on it. I, you know, uh, it's an interesting question about this because it just occurred to me, specifically this line, when we sort of gave the premise to George whenever it was many years ago, the only other thing we knew about the movie was that there was a cowboy actor who would be enlisted to be in this kind of uh, drawing room drama who would be given a line reading and the line would be, with it, it were t with it, it were so simple, yes. So we knew that before we knew basically anything else about the movie. <laughs> my, my own personal favorite, frankly, one that has, has always resonated is Never Leave a Man Behind from Raising Arizona. Um, I actually, I'm going to take some questions from the audience right after this question, which is that, uh, speaking of your writing... My own favorite is this is what you get when you fuck a stranger in the <laughs> ass. <laughs> that also is a good thing. <laughs> Your screenplays. By the way, when yeah. we <laughs> when we had to do what they call TV looping for that line, 
you have to find a line because you can't say this is what you get when you fuck a stranger in the ass on television. Um, and maybe you're not supposed to say it on a podcast either. I don't know. Um, you, uh, we had to come up with an alternative that would fit in the lip. Fit you know, in the mouth. Of the, yes. So John, what was it? Well, we did. Since he says it so many times, we made up. We had him say different things every time. This is what you get when you find a straggler in the Alps. <laughs> This is what you get when you feed a stranger scrambled eggs. <laughs> we sat in the studio with Goodman doing it for like an hour, and it and had what a good is the time. Line? I don't even know what they used. For, yeah, I hope they used the straggler in the Alps. That would actually be great. I can just picture people watching that on TV. Oh, what does that mean? It's another great Coen Brothers line. Um, your screenplays will always talk up to their, the viewers. Uh, we hear so. I mean, it's not any strange thing to say that that not with that line down. we don't. That not with that line you don't. But they talk up, and I and I feel like it's it's it is such a rare thing to actually have films and have screenplays that really uh, assume the audience's intelligence and and go with it. Is there ever a moment though when you're writing it or you're directing it where you maybe say, you know what, this this maybe is is too far afield. This reference might be too too oblique. No, we don't. But it's funny in the context of talking about uh, you know. This is what you get when you fuck a stranger in the ass and <laughs> talking about how smart the screenplays are. <laughs> Maybe shows my um, inner 13 year old. Yeah, I think that's a smart line. Yes, time. exactly. I, I, uh, no, we sort of blithely go where we want to go in that respect. And then, well, like for then, instance, this one has a juvenile humor like you've just seen. And then we put Herbert Marcuse in it for science. There's a, a probably to most people a fairly obscure uh, political philosopher from the 60s who was a uh, Marxist. Uh, and he's a big character in the movie and you can't say that many mainstream Hollywood movies feature Herbert Marcuse. We were, we were thinking maybe if they did, the studio did screenings, research screenings for the movie, the cards would be, uh, we want more Herbert Marcuse. <laughs> more Herbert Marcuse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take any questions here. We'll start on the left-hand side or in the front. Anyone? Uh, hey, guys. All right. You both obviously work as a team a lot of the time, so I have two questions. One is, how do you, what is the best kind of workflow with you guys? Since obviously there's like maybe a di if there's a disagreement, how do you guys settle that out? If there's something like you both really agree on, what, like what's the best way of getting there? And second is, what's one project you guys have really, really wanted to do but you haven't been able to do yet? Well, okay. Uh, the I just got to say the word workflow is a big turnoff for me, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you mean. Um, yes, I, you know, I guess it's best explained just in the context of making movies in general because it's, it's such a collaborative social enterprise in every respect, not just the fact that we work together um, as a team, but... Uh, it's a team sport making movies, you know, it's you work with a huge team of people and as we were talking about before, many of them are people that, I mean, you could say most of them are the major sort of people involved in the movies are uh, people that we work with over and over again. So in that respect, working with each other for all these years and working as a team is not something that's at all alien to the process. You, you have... Uh, you find a consensus and you go from the consensus. It's not about arguing or you know, uh, having different points of view necessarily. It's finding the similar point of view. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Oh, what have we not done that we've really... We've been really lucky, actually, I have to say. Um, we kind of have been able to do what we wanted to do. Um, uh, I don't know. There was a movie... There was oh, one yeah. movie... Yeah. Uh, there was one movie that we... Uh, this happens so frequently to other people that we're lucky. It's really only happened to us once. There was one movie that we wrote a script for and pursued, actually did some scouting, that uh, fell apart. Uh, it was a, a called To the White Sea. It was from a novel by James Dickey. So that was the one sort of the one that got away for us, unfortunately. From a physical standpoint, just talking about writing, do you guys do a thing like Billy Wilder and Izzy Diamond did, where like one guy would like lay on the couch, the other one would type, and then you kind of trade off, vice versa? Do you guys have a system like that? We do a lot of napping. <laughs> <laughs> one man naps, the other man, other man writes, and then vice versa. Uh, which, which one of your films are you most like, proud of? Like, is there one that stands out like, you know, out of the other ones to you? Or uh, You'd think there might be. Uh, I think we both... 
don't look at them again. And, and try, you know, you think about them for so long, each one for uh, a year, more than a year, writing it and then making it and cutting it and whatever. And when it's done, frankly, I'm happy to not have to think about it anymore. And I basically don't. So I don't really uh, compare them. I remember, you know, production experiences of some of them as being fun and others being harder. But the finished movie itself, uh, you know, is... Probably in terms of the one you're most proud of, where pretty much is probably justifiably, you know, the first one's probably the hardest one to get done, you know, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to make movies and you manage to make that first movie, that's a, it's a bigger hurdle to get over than most of them are, but yeah. Hi, uh, I'm currently an aspiring filmmaker in film school trying to find my voice, and I was wondering if you had any advice for me. Oh, uh, well, um, yeah. I mean, it's really to... I mean, it starts with us with the writing, you know? So it's the more you write, the more you kind of know what's going or what you want to have go on when you get on a set and start making the movie and the more power you have because you own the material. So that would be my advice. But it's a hard question. It's like legitimately what people want to know. How do I get started? How do you, how do you get going? And it's just uh, impossible to answer because it happens differently for everybody who's done it or, you know, but as Joel says, for us, it started as, as writers and writing, and that was, um, it's just, uh, whoever was sitting up here who you asked that question would give you a different answer, and it's, uh, who knows what's relevant to you. I don't know, man. It sounds like a cop-out, but that's, yeah. Do you guys remember the film that you were watching maybe back in Minnesota where you said, you know what, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to do this. Was there one moment that, that you can clue into with that? Well, and for us, it didn't exactly. I, I, I can't say that. I think either of us would say there was a eureka moment like that from watching movies. We we have been making movies and kind of making them together actually since we were kids. We would do it on, you know, Super 8, and we'd watch movies and then we'd go out and we'd remake what we saw on TV the night before. Where we'd come up with a story and we remake rem do it in the backyard. It was just playing around, honestly, and um, I think it was more that idea was how do we j keep just playing around. Um. Hi, I have a technical question. Uh, digital version, uh, film versus digital. Uh, I, I mean, you shot 35 millimeter film, yeah. and <coughs> question would be how happy you, would, you were with the film or if you're going to shoot the digital next time, or? Uh, this was shot on 35. Actually, we've never shot digitally. And to answer your question, very happy with the result, uh, with the film capture, as they say now. And, uh, you know, I, we're, I, you know, for the foreseeable future, I, you know, we, we like film and are sticking with it. You know, it's, I don't, Actually, I don't know how threatened it is. A lot of people do still like film, although digital has certainly become the standard. I mean, what would be very nice from the point of view of a filmmaker is if you continue to have choice in terms of all kinds of things. And, and whether you shoot digitally or whether you shoot on film is one of those things that you want to have the choice depending on the project and all kinds of other factors that other things that factor into whether or not one way is better than the other, but that's true of every, you know, I wish we had the choice as for a brief sort of window in film history you did where you could shoot in color or you could shoot black and white. I mean, that would be nice too. Um, it's, more choice is a good thing. So we're, I'm not in any way anti-digital, but I wouldn't want to see it become the only format you can shoot in. As you guys, one last question to wrap up. As you guys are, are either planning the film or in the writing stages, do you, do you think about it visually in terms of this is a moment where this is going to happen here or there's going to be this kind of zoom here? Do you guys have that kind of written in or kind of think about it uh, early on? 
I see. In the script, you mean? Yeah, is or it, just, or uh, even just thinking about it, saying this would be great if we did, had a shot that looked like this, or, or a moment that uh, that you kind of can, can describe it visually to your to each other, and you want to make sure that that shot is in there visually like that. Once in a while, uh, down to the degree of specificity of a particular shot, occasionally yes, and. Yeah, it depends on the scene, and even if it's not uh, spe thinking about it in terms of a specific shot, just the kind of feeling for the scene, which means how it looks, right. obviously. Like I'm even thinking of those, like the scene in Barton Fink that goes through the the crowd dr crowd during the dance sequence, or even in, in Raising Arizona, the shot that careens along the ground and winds up inside of of the mouth, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yes, but. I think probably, specifically with those two examples, I would say probably not in the dance scene in the USO, but probably yes in the other scene, yeah. Is, you know. Yeah. So yeah, on a case-by-case -case basis, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Hail Caesar opens February 5th. Thanks very much, Joel and Ethan Cohen.